Don't ask? Hmm. Let's get on with it. A little weird. Ow, Frost. <laughs> It's only a flesh wound. Welcome to Azeroth, land of warriors and magic. <laughs> magic isn't real. Psychics and aliens, most definitely. But magic? Let's not kid ourselves. Surely this land can easily be conquered without fancy lightning bolts. The laws are simple. Only use medieval units, static defense, and heroes. For example, footmen, watchtowers, and Arthas. Witchcraft is forbidden. No magical spells or items allowed. But if an ability or item can be explained as mundane, it's good. For example, Arthas's devotion aura is clearly his raw charisma inspiring his troops forward. Now obviously orcs, elves, and undead aren't real, but let's entertain this delusion. These are just barbarians, forest tribes, and cultists using medieval weaponry. Anywho, the run will be done on normal difficulty, because medieval combat is indeed quite mundane. Also, I'm pretty new to the game, so uh, bear with me. Chasing visions is fairly straightforward. Get Thrall to the orc camp, put him in timeout, and get the axe-wheedling grunts to the end of the mission. Like a lore. The first stone axes were developed as early as 6000 BC, while the battle axe is said to come from the Viking Age, from 793 to 1066 AD, and was popular from the 11th to 14th centuries. It was used as a close combat weapon, though it was eventually replaced by the sword. Departures requires me to build farms, a barracks, and a few grunts. The second quest... <coughs> That's an, um, interesting building animation. After using my watchtowers to repel an alliance assault, I send my Ord of Grunts into the camp and rescue Thrall's comrade, Grom. Like a Belor, the guard or watchtower served as a way for guards to see long distances in all directions. In Roman times, lines of towers would serve as a warning system for invaders. This continued to the medieval age, with the Italians using coastal towers to watch for Saracen ships. Stronred requires me to get Prince Arthas and his footmen to the titular town and repel a barbarian invasion. Footmen wield swords and shields while Arthas wields a battle hammer, perfectly medieval for this challenge. Along the way, I defeat bandits and rescue little Tibby, who... What is that? What the f*** is that? After washing my eyes with holy water, I defeat the raiders and the mission ends. Like a lore. A war hammer was another close quarters weapon in medieval times. Longer variants dismounted enemy riders, while shorter variants were for infantry or wielded by cavalry. These hammers had a spiked flat side to dent armor, and a sharp side to pierce it. Black Rock and Roll requires me to reach the alleged necromancer Kel'Thuzad and free him from living. Now I'm supposed to use these tiny riflemen to kill the nearby dragon, clearly a giant scaly bird, and historically, guns were a thing in the late Middle Ages. They just weren't that good. I decide not to use them since I'm pretty sure rifles weren't developed until after the medieval- STOP! Okay, it turns out that rifled weapons may have first been used in the 15th century, the tail end of the medieval age. I didn't actually bother checking this until after I recorded the human campaign, though. Look, if I just spam guns, I may as well just be playing Terran. Cannons seem perfectly medieval to me, though. Thus, I build towers which rain arrows on the winged beasts. After all, it's not medieval without castles. Eventually, my legion meets Kel'Thuzad and kills him, ending the mission. Like a lore, while well, cannons first appeared in Song, China during the 12th century, the first mortars were said to be used by the Ottomans during the siege of Constantinople in 1453. Though popular, like many guns at the time, they were fairly inaccurate. Ravages of the Plague has me facing the Ravages of the Plague, who I'm introduced to Jaina Proudmoore, a powerful sorceress with a variety of spells. But magic isn't real, so to time out you go. Using Arthas and his troops, I fight my way to a magic fountain, clearly just a spring of fresh water. After a quick water break, my troops continue destroying infected structures. I also meet some priests who wield magic. Not on my watch. After catching up to Kel'Thuzad, my troops defeat a warrior with an extra limb, ending the mission. 
Cult of the Damned requires me to fight my way to Kel'Thuzad and slay him as he engages in completely mundane, non-magical activities. You know the drill, spam footmen and mortars, raise shields, slay Kel'Thuzad, and win. March of the Scourge is about the March of the Scourge. Despite Arthas' efforts, several villagers are already infected and attack the army. I need to hold until Uther and Jaina return with reinforcements. To hold my base, I build up lines of guard and cannon towers, as well as footmen and mortars. To deal with the bonus, I send Arthas to stall the enemy convoy while also fortifying the nearby spring. When the caravan arrives, my towers rip them to shreds. While my lines collapse, reinforcements arrive, and the mission ends. I track the man behind the cultist, Smalganus, to the city of Stratholme. He's a demon, which is quite medieval for this challenge, so it's exorcist time. Unfortunately, this is still the Middle Ages, and medicine can't help all these infected citizens, so it's also purging time. Arthas effectively fires Uther and breaks up with Jaina, leaving him alone to commit extremely non-peaceful acts against the populace. I need to purge a hundred civilians before Malganus can convert them to his ranks. To this end, I employ footmen, mortars, and knights to cross the vast distances of the city. Malganus periodically attacks my troops, forcing me to drive him off. This gives me a respite to sanitize the city. Eventually, I clear out enough infected, and the mission ends. Likeable lore, the first knights were cavalry units, who often held land as fiefs with their lords. From the age of seven, a potential knight would start out as a page, receiving training in combat, art, and dance before becoming a squire around age 15. They serve as shield bearers to their patron before being knighted themselves. Over time, defeats to infantry and archers, as well as the development of artillery and more centralized monarchies, led to knights becoming obsolete. The Shores of Northrend is about the Shores of Northrend. I lead my men inland and find Muradin, another warrior trying to stop the cultists. He has several... helicopters and riflemen. Not on my watch. I need to find Muradin's men and raise Malganus' base. The biggest threat in this mission are the enemy birds, which routinely attack my strongholds. To counter them, I use the expert tactic of spamming guard towers to shoot them down. After finding and purging Muradin's men, I lay siege to the enemy fortress, using walls of guard towers to bring down enemy birds. Eventually, my army breaks the enemy defenses, and the mission ends. Dissension requires me to burn Arthas' fleet. Why? Because the king wants everyone to go home, and Arthas is still high on that sweet, sweet vengeance. Muradin just kind of goes along with it. While I only start out with my heroes and two mortars, I eventually hire several mercenaries in the area. With my heroes and ogres in front and my ranged forces in the back, I fight my way to each ship and burn it to the ground. To reach the final two ships, I pull a Annabel, rushing through a mountain pass and losing most of my army in the process. Nevertheless, I burn each ship, and the mission ends. Burned our ships! Like a balor, mercenaries were widely used in the Middle Ages. William the Conqueror, King Henry II, the Byzantine Varangian Guard, and the Mamluk Sultanate are just a few examples of this. The destruction caused by the Thirty Years' War alongside the professionalization of the army and outlawing of mercenaries would see an end to their use in conventional warfare. Frostborn is a fairly straightforward affair. I need to find the fancy sword Frostborn to defeat Malganus and end the Scourge. In the meantime, my base is repeatedly attacked by cannibals, cultists, and birds that can freeze things with their breath. Arthas gets the sword, but Muradin falls asleep on the job, leaving us to finish the mission on our own. With a force of footmen, knights, and mortars, I push through cultist lines. To deal with the birds, I use the expert tactic of spamming guard towers to overwhelm them. Eventually, I raise Malganus' bases, and Arthas kills Malganus, ending the mission. Also, Arthas sends his father to early retirement and burns the kingdom down. It, it's not important. Trudging through ashes is the first undead mission. They're clearly just knights and cultists wearing demonic armor. Anywho, I need to reunite the Cult of the Damned for mundane, non-magical purposes. I get access to Arthas and some cannibals. I need to be sneaky since the map is crawling with footmen and knights. As Arthas increases in strength, I also give him unholy aura. It's clearly just his corrupting charisma bolstering his troops. Anywho, after making it to the graveyard, I get access to knights in bone armor. After I gather the cultists, 
the mission ends. Likeable lore, Europeans used to eat bodies. For centuries, European royalty, clergy, and scientists would use human bones, blood, and fat as remedies for various ailments. It was to the point that grave robbers would take mummies from Egypt and Irish burial grounds to sell for profit. The idea was that like cures like. If you have a headache, eat a skull. Blood's acting up, drink some blood. Ironically, similar practices in the Americas were criticized as savage. Digging up the dead requires me to recover Count Luzon's remains. Afterwards, I have to get an urn to stick him in. I get access to Arthas, cannibals, and meat wagons, catapults that fling corpses at people. With a mix of cannibals, Arthas, and catapults, I smash through paladin lines and face my old pal Uther. He falls, and the mission ends. Likeable lore. According to Italian notary Gabriel de Musi, during the Mongol siege of Kaffa, large parts of the army died of plague. So to dispose of them, they began flinging infected bodies into the city, causing the inhabitants to catch it too. The siege ultimately failed, though some speculate the disease may have contributed to the spread of the Black Death. Into the Eternal Realm focuses on the Eternal Realm. I need to breach the Elf Gate to secure a route to the elven city of Silvermoon. Do I get access to necromancers? Raise this. The Ranger Sylvanus repeatedly leads raids on my castle, but with a mix of Arthas, cannibals, and catapults, I repel her assault. While the pointy people use the force to impede my advance through the expert tactic of tossing bodies at trees, I push through pointy eared lines. Eventually, I breach the Elf Gate. And the mission ends. Gay of the Three Boons requires me to destroy three altars to retrieve key pieces. Ever the best, Sylvanus destroys a bridge, forcing me to use several transports to cross the rivers. Now, Pi, you may say, they didn't have airships in the Middle Ages. I prefer to think of them as floating vessels. Sounds pretty medieval to me. Also, the only other option is using magic portals, so it can't be helped. I gain access to Crypt Fiends, which can bring down aerial threats with webs. There are... Uh... <coughs> to reach each altar, I land a force of cannibals, net fighters, and catapults at weak spots in their perimeter. Using catapults to focus down towers and net fighters to bring down enemy birds, I destroy each altar and reach the gate. Ending the mission. Likeable lore. Weighted nets weren't really used for medieval warfare but they were used by gladiators, so close enough. Ratiarius, or net fighters, were equipped to the style of fishermen. They'd use weighted nets and tridents and were lightly armored. To beat their foes, they'd use their nets to tangle them and their spears to finish them off. All of Silvermoon requires me to reach the Sunwell, a fancy fountain for completely mundane, non-magical purposes. I also need to finish off Sylvanas and prevent her from alerting their forces. After clearing out the magic towers at my base and repelling the ranger's first assault, I take Arthas to intercept the runner every time they move in. For some reason, I get access to useless gargoyles, which are statues and clearly incapable of moving. Anywho, after gathering a force of cannibals, net fighters, and catapults, I overrun Sylvanas' defenses and finish her off. Arthas has a drug-induced hallucination about her and then proceeds to attack Silvermoon. After punching a hole in their defenses, I destroy several mundane, non-magical structures and reach the well, ending the mission. Black Rock and Roll 2 requires me to defeat several champions in the area and defeat the barbarian base in the northeast. I get access to a drug-induced hallucination of Kel'Thuzad and some giant birds, but as a medieval commander, I don't need such beasts to win. After losing my entire army in the first attack, I rebuild and lay siege to the enemy camps. Using catapults to lure the enemy from their towers, I overwhelm each champion and destroy the main stronghold, ending the mission. The Siege of Dalaran requires me to defeat three Archmages, allowing my forces to seize the city. I gain access to abominations, clearly just suffering from extreme flagellants. Using these to tank and my net fighters and catapults to support, I defeat the first Archmage with ease. The second one is dispatched by Arthas, and the third is beaten after using the expert tactic of sacrificing my entire army to beat one unit. Likeable lore. The Order of St. Lazarus was a group of knights who primarily cared for lepers. 
Leprosy is a disease that causes blindness, paralysis, and deformity in fingers and toes. The first warrior monks and even the Order's first grandmasters were all lepers. One famous example of a leper knight is Baldwin IV, who led an army to victory over Saladin at the Battle of Montgessard. Under the Burning Sky requires me to defend the hallucinated Kel'Thuzad for 30 minutes while he reads a book. Odd choice for a final mission, but it'll do. To fend off the enemy, I build up a mix of night fighters and abominations. As the mission progresses, I also get access to fell hounds, which are clearly just war dogs with fancy blades. While I initially split my forces between my base and the two ramps to Kel'Thuzad, my enemies prove too numerous. So I concentrate my armies into two groups. One group defends my base and the other covers one of the ramps. Arthas holds the third ramp and buys time while I build up a third force to protect him. As the enemy launches a final offensive, I use the expert tactic of abandoning everything to protect the objective. Ending the mission. Likeable lore, war dogs have been used since the ancient times. They would bark, tear, and break up enemy formations. In the 12th century, the Irish used wolfhounds against Norman invaders. During the War of the Roses, both houses York and Lancaster bought mastiffs to represent their side. Landfall is the first mission in the Orc campaign, clearly just barbarians. It requires me to link up with the survivors of the journey to Kalimdor. There's some nomadic horsemen and warriors wearing bullheads fighting each other. While I can't heal my grunts, my javelin throwers apparently have access to band-aids, but only for themselves. So I use them to lure the enemies in and tank the damage. Eventually I meet up with more survivors and even forge an alliance with the bull warriors. After upheeling the horse riders at the bull camp, the mission ends. Like a bulldozer. During medieval times, javelins were fletched like arrows and were used by Anglo-Saxon, Norse, Welsh, Spanish, Arab, and Irish armies. One notable example would be the Irish Kurds, which served as shock troops who wielded sword and javelin together. A long march requires me to escort Cairn and his bull warriors to three oases around the map. Since the bulls prefer to follow Thrall around, I need to be careful to keep him out of combat as I advance. To minimize the risk of Thrall being useful, I clear a path to each oasis before moving him forward. As the mission progresses, I get access to cavalry and catapults, enabling me to best the nomads and reach the final oasis, ending the mission. Likeable lore, catapults have been used since ancient times as a siege weapon. They relied on either the release of tension on bent wooden beams or torsion in twisted cords to launch stones, spears, and other objects at long range. It was outraged by trebuchets, but was far more mobile. Cry of the War Song requires me to access a barbarian outpost to hire some floating vessels. I get access to Kodo Beasts, clearly just war rhinos. Unfortunately, Grom decides to attack several Alliance settlements in the area. Now, I'm always up for a little warmongering, but my issue is that Grom attacks before my army is ready, forcing me to hold up behind guard towers as I build up a force of riders, grunts, and catapults to lay siege to the enemy. Eventually, I clear a path to the Goblin Lab, slaying a Orscon and hunting some pesky birds. Like a Balor. While it's unlikely rhinos were ever used in actual warfare, there are a few records that attest to their military service. German printmaker Albrecht Dürer made several illustrations suggesting that the Portuguese used imported rhinos to counter war elephants. However, this observation was based largely off a duel between a rhino and a young elephant for entertainment. The Ahoms in northeast India may have also drugged rhinos and sent them into enemy lines. Whatever the truth, it's important to remember that rhinos are incredibly ill-tempered, have poor eyesight, and have backs that are ill-suited for riding. Spirits of Ashenvale requires me to harvest lumber while the forest tribes launch assaults on my castle. Women! Oh, yes. They're women! I get access to Grom and... Shobbins? With magic? Not on my watch. 15,000 units of lumber may seem like a lot, but the forest folk have several large trees that conveniently provide 3,000 units each. So I burn down their homes. A couple of green men try to sell me these weird mech suits, which are clearly not medieval, so I break them down for parts. Using a mix of cavalry, catapults, grunts, and javelin throwers, I embark on a merry quest of mass unliving side, slicing through my enemies and chopping the forest down. Ending the mission. 
Hunter of Shadows requires me to beat an alleged god named Cenarius. He performs completely mundane, non-magical things as the forest tribes overwhelm my outlying strongholds. To repel the initial assault, I mass a force of javelin throwers and riders, enabling me to ensnare and bring down the enemy birds as they peck at my perimeter. I need to find a mountain for completely mundane, non-magical purposes. To reach it, I gather a force of riders and javelin throwers to fight my way through several alleged magic users. After executing them, I reach the fountain and Grom takes a sip. I'm not sure what Manoroth put in that fountain, but presumably it involves some kind of medieval steroid as Grom and the other orcs get, as the younger folks say, quite jacked. After fighting through purple lines, my forces fight Cenarius and bring him down. Ah! I knew he was no god. A true god cannot be destroyed, only remade. Or reforged, though according to Blizzard, getting reforged just means making the original, but worse. Meanwhile, Thrall and Cairn have reached the base of the mountain. It's guarded by an expedition led by Jaina, which I have to fight through. I'm supposed to use these scaly birds to breach Jaina's air defenses, but I hardly need them to win. Instead, I once again gather a force of riders, axemen, javelin throwers, and catapults, and scale the cliffs with these completely non-magical, definitely not floating siege towers. To aid in the assault, I use Cairn and his bull-ed warriors to tank, and my riders and javelins to bring down the enemy birds. Despite heavy losses, I eventually overcome their defenses and end the mission. Michael Lore During the Middle Ages, clubs had metal spikes to pierce armor. Their use predated swords, serving as useful close-quarter weapons. There are several types. Spiked clubs, cudgels, morning stars, maces, and, uh, this thing. The oracle requires me to fight my way through a labyrinth filled with cultists. Unfortunately, there's too many enemies for my medieval troops to fight alone. Initially, I try to use healing wards to keep my grunts alive, as they're clearly just banners with inspirational messages for my warriors. Perfectly medieval for this challenge, and my troops are all dead. This mission's a bust, I'll just have to play it normally. This proves more difficult than expected, as I just spent the last 25 missions avoiding spellcasting and leveling thrall. Evidently, I need more practice. Nevertheless, by spamming inspirational banners, I get the heart of a zoon. By spamming Stomp with Care, and I also raise the final bridge. And the mission ends. My Demons Be Driven requires me to work with Jaina to save Grom from his blood addiction. My base is periodically attacked by roided out hellscreen troops and these weird infernal things, probably just guys in rock armor. To push forward, I use Caird alongside a mix of bull warriors, riders, axemen, javelin throwers, and catapults. Using the expert tactic of spamming towers and throwing troops at the enemy until they stop living, I fight my way to Grom and we have an intervention. Grom gives his life to beat Manoroth. And the mission ends. Enemies at the Gage is the first Forest Tribe mission. I get access to Taronda, who uses a bow and arrow. I also get access to archers. Very medieval. Uh, ignore the glowing balls. Clearly they're just workers carrying really bright lanterns. Anywho, I need to destroy the enemy stronghold to the west. To do this, I obtain several bears and archers. With bears to tank and archers to spank, my forces bring down the paladin, and the mission ends. Likeable lore. While the bow has existed for thousands of years, the longbow gained fame during the Hundred Years' War. It was decisive in securing English victories at Agincourt and Cressy, where its superior range and firing rate beat the French knights and crossbowmen. Daughters of the Moon requires me to sneak past the Legion's guards and regroup with Taronda's forces. To do this, I need to use Taronda's cloak, I mean hide ability. I also get access to archers, cavalry, and even ballista. As the night ends, Taronda's forces apparently forget how to hide, so I launch a frontal assault. Ballistas take out towers, archers and cavalry kite, and my army breaks through the gate. Likeable lore. Ballistas were ancient missile launchers. They were similar in shape to crossbows, but served a similar role to catapults. Users would use two levers with torsion, the twisting of an object, springs to load and fire projectiles. After Rome's decline, maintaining such weapons became expensive, and they were eventually replaced by devices such as the Manganel and Trebuchet. The Awakening of Storm Rage is about waking up Storm Rage. Who's Storm Rage? Tree Wizard. Apparently, the lazy Carter thinks he can sleep through a demonic invasion. 
Not on my watch. I need to fight my way through barbarian defenses and beat up several completely mundane non-magical guardians to use what's essentially a glorified alarm clock to wake up Furion. I also have to do it before the enemy chop through the forest to get him. This is supposed to be tense, but it's also the fourth time that a bunch of trees have stopped characters from doing something important. To beat the mission, I build up a force of archers, light and heavy cavalry, and ballistas. You know the drill, target down towers with ballistas, kite with my army, and lose nearly all of my troops getting to the objective. Like a balore. Heavy cavalry and light cavalry serve different roles. Heavy cavalry aim to break enemy formations, usually by charging or encircling them. Light cavalry would focus on scouting harassment and pursuing enemies. During the Crusades, both played decisive roles in battles such as Hatton, where the lighter Ayubid cavalry outmaneuvered the Europeans, and Arsif, where heavy European knights routed Saladin's forces. The Druid's Arise requires me to fight my way to the alleged tree wizards while the allied invaders clash with the Legion. The main gimmick with the mission is the lack of gold, which is supposed to force me to move my base as I run out of resources. Of course, trees can't move, so I opt to set aside money to plant a new one at each prospective gold mine. To defend my base, I assemble a force of archers and cavalry while building a bodyguard to protect Taronda. After hunting some bears, I breach the Alliance base and enter a forest of death. The enemies keep respawning because an alleged revenant is summoning them. But to kill the revenant, I need more troops. But to get more troops, I need more gold. After losing a good chunk of my army, I secure one final gold mine, destroy a rogue sentinel base, defeat the supposed revenant, and walk old fury into the druids. Brothers in Blood requires me to awaken the druids of the claw and free Furion's brother Illidan. After putting Furion and the Talon Druids in timeout, I use Taronda to tank and my cavalry and archers to deal damage. Eventually, Taronda and Furion split up. This leaves me with three light cavalry. With the expert tactic of running away from my problems, I repeatedly harass the enemies between me and the Druids. Unfortunately, I have to refrain from killing any Druids of the Claw, so I sneak my riders around and clear a path to the final chamber, allowing me to run in Furion without using him in combat. Afterwards, I get an actual army in the form of Taronda, heavy cavalry, and archers. You know the drill, tank with Taronda, focus down priority targets, and win. A destiny of flames requires me to steal a skull for completely mundane, non-magical purposes and beat the demon Tychondrius. I get access to Illidan and the Druids of the Claw. Illidan dual wields blades and sets himself on fire while the Druids punch things and roar. Sounds pretty medieval to me. To defend my base, I build numerous moon wells to give my troops fresh water. To attack, I send Illidan to scout ahead, before sending in archers, heavy and light cavalry, druids, and ballista to destroy each enemy base. Eventually, I get access to the skull, and Illidan performs an extremely mundane, non-magical transformation into a demon. While I try to avoid using him in battle, the mission informs me that I do have to use him to damage Tychondrius, so I limit him to only striking down the Dreadlord, ending the mission. Likeable lore. Druids were an ancient Celtic class of clergy who taught and judged, a name may derive from the Celtic word for knower of the oak tree. Unfortunately, most records on them are Roman sources. According to Julius Caesar, the Druids were a prestigious role that performed sacrifices and arbitrated disputes between citizens. Twilight of the Gods requires me to prevent Archimon from reaching a giant tree. To do this, I need to work with the Barbarian and Alliance forces. Both Jada and Thrall have bases to help impede the enemy, but they can't hold their positions indefinitely. After consulting ancient tomes for help, I nab the two gold mines for extra income and make sure to hire many mercenaries to rush to Jaina's base. I focus primarily on churning out archers, cavalry, and druids to support the Alliance since they already have plenty of healers. In the meantime, I strengthen Thrall's defenses with a field of boot wells. Despite my best efforts, Jaina's base is overrun, so I fall back to the second line. Thor's base holds on surprisingly well, as he has several landmines and many offensive spells to aid me. As the fight progresses, I add ballistas and bears to my army, though I'm forced to pull back by the 10 minute mark. With only my base left, I prepare a third line of moon wells, archers, and ballistas. Thankfully, I have the advantage of a fountain to quench my thirsty warriors, buying me additional time. While my bases are completely overrun, Archimon takes his sweet time walking to the tree, enabling me to secure victory. Are there none left to stand against the Legion? Tremble, mortals, and despair. <laughs> so
so can you? Nay. Nay, you cannot. Undead orcs and night elves don't exist. Even if we entertain this delusion, five of the eight undead missions require me to use some form of non-medieval anti-air, i.e. crypt fiends. Two missions require me to use zeppelins to access the objective. The oracle has too many enemies to beat with medieval only, and Destiny of Flames forces me to use Demon Illidan to beat Tychondrius. But how many missions can be done with medieval non-magical units? In total, only 26 out of 34 missions can be done with medieval units only. If we include undead missions, where I had to use Crypt Fiends for anti-air, this increases to 30 out of 34, 88%. The human campaign is most successful, partially because humans actually exist, but also because it's super all around and there are medieval options for every mission. The worst campaign is the Orc one, where I either needed zeppelins or magical units for two of the missions. If I ban the Crypt Fiend, the Undead campaign is the worst due to having no medieval anti-air. And also, the Night Elf campaign has, uh, um, trees. We, we have to use trees and glowing balls. Remember, Petroleum. Sign up, get early access, extra content, and work-in-progress updates. Shoutouts to Time, Cladis Marino, Apriacrid, and Scott Replinger for supporting the channel. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to like, share, comment, subscribe, and use completely mundane items for totally non-magical purposes. Oh no, I don't have enough gameplay recorded to make a trailer for Frozen Throne. Here, have a low effort shit post instead. Ow, Frostborn.